Now we have talked about several different types of forces. One way to classify forces is into conservative and non-conservative types. Conservative forces are ones that conserve energy. This means that all of the stored energy of these forces is available to do work and that none of the energy is lost in the system. So let's use friction as an example of a non-conservative force. If we push a box across the floor, friction does work on the box. Some of the energy used to create that work is transferred into heat energy. That thermal energy is essentially lost. It is really difficult to get that back. Now, if we lift that box off of the floor, gravity is now doing work on the box. We can get that energy back simply by dropping it. Another way to put that is to say that the path of the box, in this case, does not play a part in the effect of gravity on the box. If we lift that box straight up, the box has a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. We could also have carried the box up a set of stairs, and as long as it was the same height above the ground, the gravitational potential energy would be the same. So work done by a conservative force is independent of the path taken. So let's take our box and slide it across the floor for two meters, and then lift it up above the ground for two meters. When the box moves from A to B, the box is moving only in the horizontal direction. So gravity does not do any work on the box. But once we take the box and move it upwards, gravity does some work. Remember this work is equal to the mass times the gravity acceleration times the height that we lifted. Let's just give our box a mass of 5 kilograms, and we can plug that in to find the work done by gravity as 98 joules of energy. So what if our box takes a different path? If we lift our box 3 meters, then move it horizontally for 4 meters, and then lower it 1 meter, if we look at the net work done by gravity in this case, we have to look at the ending height off the ground. In this case, the height is the same as our last example at 2 meters. We can add up the work done by gravity in each part of our motion pretty easily. From A to B, the work done by gravity is a negative 147 joules. From B to C, there is zero work done by gravity, and from C to D, a positive 49 joules of work is done. Adding up the work done in this situation, and we end up with a negative 98 joules of work done on the box by gravity. This really does make sense since the box ended up the same height above the ground as when we just lifted it the 2 meters. So it doesn't matter what path we take. If we end up at the same place, gravity is going to be doing the same net work on our box. This is what we mean by a conservative force. If non-conservative forces such as friction are ignored, we end up with a simple and elegant relationship involving the energy of the system. What we find is that the change in the kinetic energy of the system and the change in potential energy of the system is equal to zero. We can also write that as a change in kinetic energy is equal to the negative change in potential energy. So if the compression of a spring is used to do work, the system will lose the potential energy stored in the spring, but gain the same amount of kinetic energy because of that work. Now, as you might imagine, there are a lot of ways to apply this idea based on what the situation is at any given time. Another useful representation of this idea is that the sum of the kinetic and potential energies is equal to the sum of the final kinetic and potential energies. As an example, a 0.1 kilogram toy car is propelled by a compressed spring. The car follows a track that rises 0.18 meters above the starting point. The spring is compressed 4 centimeters and has a force uh, and has a force constant of 250 newtons per meter. If friction is negligible, how fast is the car going before it starts up the ramp? So we know a few things here. We know that the change in the kinetic energy of the system is equal to the negative change in potential energy. Also that the spring force and the gravitational force are two types of conservative forces that can be considered. The car is also given a certain kinetic energy because of the compression of the spring. Since we are looking for the velocity before the car goes up the ramp, there is no vertical change in motion, so gravitational potential energy does not apply. This means that the only potential energy of our system would be the energy created by the compression of our spring. If the car starts at rest, we only need to consider our equation for the final kinetic energy in this case. 
So the kinetic energy of the 0.1 kilogram car is equal to the potential energy stored when the spring is compressed to 4 centimeters. We can plug in all these knowns and solve for the square of the velocity and find the velocity at the beginning of the ramp to be 2 meters per second. But what if we want to know the velocity at the top of the ramp? The change in kinetic energy is still equal to the negative change in potential energy. Since we are looking for befores and afters of each type of energy, we can use the long version of our conservation equation. Our initial kinetic energy is zero, so we can ignore the term for the initial kinetic energy. The initial potential energy is that of the spring when it is compressed, and the final kinetic energy is determined when the kinetic energy equation that includes velocity, since that is what we are trying to find. And the final potential energy is the gravitational potential energy because of the car's vertical movement. All right, so we are trying to find the velocity amongst all of this. If you like, you can substitute all of those numbers in and get one really scary looking sentence. Calculate a way to simplify that down a bit and eventually you can get the squared velocity by itself and the final velocity of 0 0.687 meters per second. So this is the velocity of the car at the top of the ramp if we ignore friction.